All right, guys, it has been a while. I have honestly had the topic of this video on my mind for about the last two weeks. And well, after another Zverev debacle tonight, this video just had to be made today. You know, being in the Midwest, it's all right if my sleep schedule gets messed with a little bit tonight. Break has arrived for me. It's been too long of a gap since my last video. And honestly, this video I've had on my mind ever since coincidentally enough, I watched that Zverev Jensen Brooksby match that finished at what, like 5 a.m., 6 a.m. around there in Acapulco. And while I was watching that match, I was thinking to myself, there are these random matches when you watch Alexander Zverev where you really question to yourself, has he regressed? Just how much better has he really gotten? And coming off a career year in 2021, I will say that he definitely did improve. There's no doubt about that. His form from the Olympics up until pretty much the close of 2021 with that World Tour Finals win in Turin. Of course, sprinkled in there were a couple of disappointing performances, but nonetheless, he ended 2021 on a tear, and just watching him in that stretch, you could see the two big issues that have been noted by many, many people in the second serve and forehand were much more reliable. Only a very select few matches where the second serve broke down in that stretch. And you know what? I'll probably give that Zverev an edge as his best form ever. Before it, I probably would have gone with 27, 2018 portions of those years where he showed out in Masters Finals and the World Tour Finals in 2018. His game through the latter stretch of 2021 just seemed more sustainable and I would say he could take a moral victory out of the one slam he participated in that 2021 hot streak at the US Open. I would take a moral victory out of his five set loss to Novak. That Zverev definitely just seemed more stable. You saw 2017-2018 Zverev fall on his face a lot in slams. Definitely a stark contrast there. But where I feel Zverev got more solid, I also do think in the process he got a bit more passive and it's up for debate, but I don't know that his peaks were as high as those 2017-2018 wins and Masters and the World Tour Finals. A lot of those he was pretty much blowing big three members off the court and the only time it was reminiscent like that would be Tokyo 2021 at the Olympics. But I don't know that he's ever played better on clay than he did at Madrid and Rome 2018. Plus, I think it's fair to say that it's up for debate whether a couple of his hardcore showings in 2021 were better than, in particular, I'd say the last three matches of his World Tour Finals 2018 run. Basically, what I'm saying Zverev, yeah, I'd say he became a better player in 2021, definitely less prone to upsets. I'd say more reliable in best of five as well as in the clutch moments. And then we get to 2022, where Sasha Zverev has without a doubt regressed. You're again getting those matches where his forehand looks very meek. Each loss he's taken has been pretty bad. I would say the most forgivable of the lot would be his loss tonight to Tommy Paul. Well, actually scrap that. That was probably FAA at the ATP Cup. Felix just outplayed him there. This was still a bad loss, make no mistake about it, but Tommy Paul played excellent. First set was out of his mind, really showed me something. I've always been impressed with his racket skills, but he really was firing on all cylinders in the first set. Very, very impressive. But after that, Sasha did get him to come down to earth. Similarly to how I felt during that Brooksby Acapulco match, he didn't really step up the aggression. He was just able to drag his opponent into more rallies, being way more reactive than proactive for the most part. But nonetheless, he got up a break in the third. Played just an atrocious 4-2 in the third service game, where having just gotten the break, he double faulted four times to give Tommy Paul the break right back. 
Got it to a breaker and Tommy Paul thoroughly outclassed Sasha in that third set breaker. And now we're seeing a start to 2022 that is eerily reminiscent for Sasha of his step back in 2019 after two great years in 2017 and 2018. Similarly here, 2020-2021 were very good for Zverev and literally to a T he is replicating that three years later and he's about to be 25 in April you could afford this type of mini regression back in 2019 it wasn't ideal of course but you could afford it but in a little over a month Verev is gonna be 25 he faked us out with how good he was in 2021 at the back end so much so that you had this dude parading around saying that Medvedev, Novak, and him are the new big three? Well, with the combined fact that Rafa Nadal has come out of the gates flying in 2022, as well as Zverev doing the exact opposite, those comments have absolutely aged like milk. And to be fair, I'm not totally just going to rag on Zverev for this. His other two counterparts, who he's been associated with the most closely with his next-gen peers, has been Daniil Medvedev and Stefano Tsitsipas, both of whom, you could also argue, have not really improved all that much. I kind of always got the feeling Tsitsipas' best surface was clay, even though the results to back that up didn't really come until 2020 and 2021, so I'd say, yeah, he's definitely gotten better there. But aside from that, pretty much everywhere else, that one fatal flaw of his return being so poor, combined with how iffy his backhand is on defense, particularly when slicing, he is probably working on improving those, but it hasn't really translated to being any different than it was back when he popped onto the scene in 2018 and 2019. And I don't think Tsitsipas has looked particularly good this year aside from a select few matches here and there but I also give him a pass considering he's coming off of pretty major elbow surgery. The results have still been good and he's had a couple of awesome matches like the Sinner match in Australia most notably. More often though he has looked quite shaky in my opinion but you know I'll give him until clay before I'm really that concerned. For what it's worth, I definitely do think Steph, title-wise, should have cashed in more at this point. I used to worry more about Tsitsipas mentally, and he hasn't really gotten better as a closer, which has been my real problem with his mental strength. It's resulted in just a ridiculous amount of gut-punching losses. But at this point, it's probably more the glaring technical issues on the return. He does a lot of great stuff. He has that rare elite court craft, and he's probably the most comfortable of his next-gen peers at the net. His forehand is dynamic, but with his return issues being what they are, there does seem to be a cap on what he can do outside of clay and slower hardcore surfaces. There's really not much more to say about him. There's really only so much better he can get without addressing that one Achilles heel of a weakness. And then the last member of the small three, if you will, with Daniil Medvedev. I do think Daniil Medvedev has gotten better, but it's not really necessarily in the areas of weakness. Most prominently, in my opinion, I think Medvedev's serve has improved a lot ever since he first broke through in that summer of 2019. Standing at 6-6, I always thought Medvedev had a pretty good precise serve, but it's gotten even better over the last year. I think he's more comfortable on passing shots now, which is good considering a tactic against Medvedev has been finding your way to the net. And that's probably what I would highlight the most. And obviously that has resulted in him finding his way to becoming the first world number one, not named Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, or Murray since early 2004. 
and that's definitely a remarkable achievement, albeit I don't think that Medvedev's journey to number one was some triumphant march like Andy Murray's was, but nonetheless he did some great work throughout the last year to set himself up to inherit that position after what's happened with Djokovic unable to play at so many different venues. Three straight hardcourt major finals, his first grand slam in the process, was right there to win a second, unable to close the deal against Nadal. But honestly, I mark that up more as a credit to Rafa than I do it being some monumental choke by Medvedev. Nadal to me, similar to Djokovic against Tsitsipas at Roland Garros 2021 in that final, not to that extent because Novak was clearly the better player over the last three sets. It was tighter here in this final, but I still think Nadal was noticeably enough the better player, probably through the last four sets. He blew the second, very well could have won in four. But a big reason Daniil wasn't able to close that deal is because of the one glaring weakness. Notice a pattern here? And for Daniil, to me, that would be the difficulty he has in injecting pace or having that one big weapon to finish points off the ground. And typically that shot is gonna have to be the forehand and Daniil Medvedev's forehand just simply is not that, even if he is more willing to go for it than say a Sasha Zverev. And getting him into those positions certainly is not easy, but when he's not outright winning points off his first serve, or the first serve setting up easy winners, he definitely has to go outside his comfort zone. You saw in summer 2019, he ended up compensating by going for big second serves in that match against Djokovic, against Rafa in the US Open final. He ended up coming to net a lot. I believe it was somewhere in the ballpark of around 60 times, and I will say it was to a surprisingly high degree of effectiveness. And he can get away with that compensating on a lot of hard courts, but it is also why you see him press so much when he plays on clay. I always feel like that surface is going to be an uphill battle for him. Now in spite of that, given the movement and the serve, I do think that Daniil Medvedev has the tools to be effective on all three of the surfaces. He's already excellent on hardcore, there's no doubt about that. But as we stand right now, the limitations certainly are there, and to a certain degree, the book is kind of out on what you can do against Medvedev. Obviously, as I stated earlier, it's very difficult to execute, but you've seen people use the wide serve because of his return position in conjunction with that, the serve and volley being an effective play against him, employing a lot of slice. He's gotten more consistent and probably more consistently tougher to beat, but a lot of the issues you saw when he first made his name in 2018 and 2019 still are prevalent today. But what I'm getting at with these three who are the three most major figures spearheading the next gen, they're all flawed. And all three are entering or in what are usually considered the prime years of a tennis player's career. And it's not a bad thing for there not to be these dominant all-time figures in tennis. I believe after the big three, for the most part, you'll probably have multiple guys around the range of like two, three slams, and maybe a couple guys go beyond that. But I do find it very hard to see a 10 Grand Slam winner in the coming future. Even that ballpark of seven to eight slams is going to be tough. And again, that's not a bad thing. It's just that you do feel a lot of these guys should be further along than they are right now. And big picture, who knows how long that window stays open for them to be at the top of the game. It may even close earlier than we think because a big revelation early in this year is that the generation following these guys, they're starting to come on. You all know the guy who I think does have that it factor, does have the potential to be an all-time great. Carlos Alcaraz has gotten exponentially better this year, and that has been very, very clear. 
he is well ahead of schedule. Felix Oje Aliasim, clearly, in spite of the loss today, has taken a big step forward. And on the other hand, the old guard and Nadal and Djokovic are still very much here doing their thing. And going back to 2017, they've either been the two best or one of them has been the best player in the world. And I feel like this year, Rafa is getting away with a lot of things that I thought 2021 Djokovic was getting away with. I would be a hypocrite if I didn't acknowledge that. You just saw Rafa a day ago get away with probably his worst match of the year against Sebastian Korda. And seeing it over and over again over the last couple of years, I'm starting to come to the realization that the reason that a lot of these guys continue to choke against the big three, particularly Nadal and Djokovic, is just because at its core, those two are better players. Even declined from their physical primes, they're just quite simply better tennis players. Their shots do not break down. Stuff like anticipation comes into play when you think about how they think more clearly, execute their patterns more consistently. They're superior in the combined serve return dynamics. And that has to weigh on you. And I feel like in the last year in particular, I've just come to terms with that. The comebacks are still remarkable feats. I'm never going to be numbed by those guys' greatness like that, but I do feel now that there is a reason for them happening all the time. And with both the old guard and the next next gen coming from both directions, it really is making me think about just how much longer this window is going to be open for these guys that we considered the next gen to really make a bigger imprint on the tennis landscape right now. You know, my video on the state of men's tennis that I recorded coincidentally during Indian Wells last year during October, I alluded to this a bit. And if I remember correctly, the comments I received, a lot of people thought that I was overreacting to stuff at the end of the year, which is fair enough. I mean, results do tend to be wackier at the end of the tennis season. But I would love to hear your thoughts now regarding this subject with the developments that have taken place already this year in 2022. Anyways, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, it would be much appreciated if you could give it a like, help it perform better in YouTube's algorithm, as well as subscribe to the channel if you're not already. I do have a couple more videos planned to drop during spring break. I can guarantee that it won't be as big a gap in my last upload. But until then, thank you again for watching, it's much appreciated, and of course, I will see y'all in the next one.